We're gonna talk about some nutrients today. I think the biggest nutrient in the game is going to be NAD. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about NAD. Let's have some fun with it. I think there's a lot of science behind it. There's a lot of um, just hype around NAD and what it does. You know, the anti-aging benefits, the neurological benefits, the mitochondrial benefits, um, the telomere lengthening and things like that. But dive a little bit into the science and um, I'll dive a little bit into how we learned it and how it benefits us now. Sure, so uh, NAD is going to be part of all of your cellular production in all of your cells. So theoretically, over time, the NAD levels will start to decrease, become less efficient. Uh, when we do any kind of IV NAD therapy, we're restoring a lot of that NAD back into the cells, flooding the cells with NAD, everything it needs to be able to make energy more effectively. So we're increasing the energy output of all of our cells. So from a health perspective, from a health optimization perspective, um, you're really going to be able to feel the effects of that. You're going to have more energy, more mental clarity, better muscular endurance. Um, and then when it comes to the other utilization of it, it's going to come into play with um, addictions and chemical dependencies. So at different concentrations, we can target NAD towards different neurotransmitters and reset those neurotransmitters. So for example, uh, someone who had uh, surgery and has been on opioids for a year, and every time they try to step off of some of these opioids, they can't. They start getting major insomnia, they start getting... Uh, Palpitation, some, night sweats, exactly. nausea. Exactly. All the side effects become too crippling for them to get off, uh, so they have to keep staying on it, and they become dependent on it. So with NAD, it's a tool for us to help take people off of it in, in about 10 days. Yeah. Uh, we start doing the NAD therapy daily and take them off of these drugs. Same thing can be said of um, any pharmaceuticals or supplementation that might be Benzodiazepines. Exactly. So uh, for benzodiazepines or anything that's having a depressive effect on the brain, um, we can start to detox some of these medications as well. Um, same thing with alcohol, um, same thing with nicotine. marijuana, nicotine. Uh, so anything that you can have a dependency for hits a certain neurotransmitter, we can reset that neurotransmitter so that you come back to baseline. What I think is so fascinating, and I think a lot of people get confused, is it has so many different benefits and effects. Like we just talked about benzodiazepines, we talked about um, opioid addiction, we talked about uh, marijuana, nicotine, all that. But then that's just one different effect at specific dosages within the bloodstream for a specific amount of days that affects neurological health um, because it increases GABA in the brain will hit the specific receptor that, let's just say, a benzodiazepine does or opiate receptor does, but it doesn't actually attach to the receptor, actually just desensitizes that receptor. So, it, you know, in simple terms, it replenishes or um, helps that receptor recover um, from getting stimulated so often by a benzodiazepine or nicotine. But then it actually increases uh, or decreases the dopamine threshold. So a lot of people that have like ADHD or just like super stressed or they're an entrepreneur, um, their dopamine threshold increases. Meaning they get stimulated by social media, they get stimulated by their work, they get stimulated and stressed and their dopamine threshold increases. Simplest example that I usually give is on social media, how long do you stay on a story? I stay on a story for half a second and I'm like, next, 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 next. Or if you're scrolling, how often do you stay on a photo? You maybe, if it intrigues you, you'll click on the more and read the caption. But if not, you're and you'll know what you know. 200 or your friends are doing instantly. That dopamine threshold is just so high. So, um, NAD will kind of decrease that threshold over time. Yeah, you can target it specifically towards dopamine. Most of us have some sort of dopamine desensitization problem just because we're staring at screens all the time like you said social media these kinds of things will certainly um, start to desensitize all of our dopamine levels and then 
what that really translates to um, throughout your daily life is that you might not feel as motivated, you might not feel as driven, you might not feel as good accomplishing tasks, your libido might drop off, might be more quick to anger. All these things are very much related to dopamine levels and how um, you're able to actually bind those receptors effectively. That sucks. Low libido sucks. Yeah, all of those <laughs> suck. I mean, it's, it really comes down to then you have to find so many different ways to try to increase dopamine levels. Now, I have to be on my phone, uh, you know, X amount more every day to feel Go on your effect. iPhone, yeah, decrease or, the activity level on that specific app. Or the, you can talk about Dopatone. There's Dopatone that can, you know, an Apex product that, you know, will desensitize that dopamine receptor as well and help replenish dopamine stores. Yeah, so from a supplemental perspective, for sure, we can go in and give your body the precursors it needs to make dopamine so that you can actually uh, produce it for yourself rather than um, relying on external stimuli to give it to you. Um, that can certainly be a tool for sure to come in and try to replenish some of those levels. A shoot back to the NAD. I think we talked about the neurological health. I think we talked about the benzodiazepines and that aspect of desensitizing the receptors. And then what about the mitochondria itself? I think you hit that a little bit in the beginning. I think how I learned NAD in school was just like nicotinamide and adenosine dinucleotide was a precursor to make more ATP in the body. So I understood it from the Krebs cycle. So how we change you know, your glucose, it goes into a whole pathway and how it gets into the cell. And uh, NAD was just a precursor to make more ATP, which is help support and run the mitochondria. And it shuttles, you know, how we do a lot of car carnitine, is carnitine shuttles into the mitochondria in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Um, I hated biology, by the way, but I understood it now because you know studied it so much. But that's how I kind of understand NAD is like it's just biochemistry. How that NAD can kind of precursor to make more ATP. And the mitochondria is that powerhouse of the cell that can operate it. Um, it's almost like your engine uh, of the cell, and then all the other pieces come into play. But uh, speak a little bit about that and what you've learned from NAD and how you're using it now. Yeah, so, you know, NAD is going to be really important for production of all of our energy for all of our cells. So, by doing that, you're optimizing all the mitochondria or the energy producing parts of all of your cells a lot more effectively. Uh, and then you're actually able to eliminate or get rid of weaker mitochondria over time. So, part of the issue that happens uh, as our NAD levels drop or as our mitochondria become less optimized, and there's a lot of things that can do that, oxidative stress, aging, um, every time we take antibiotics, it places a lot of oxidative stress on our mitochondria. Even uh, breathing. Right, any, any kind of oxygen that's coming in, if there's any inflammation in the system, it can help perpetuate some of this oxidative stress. So um, when the mitochondria are starting to deteriorate, they'll borrow energy from neighboring cells to some extent. So now instead of having one weak cell, now you have two weak cells. Um, when we take in the NAD, we're boosting all of them up together. So they don't necessarily need to borrow energy from each other in that way. Um, and you're optimizing all the weak ones, you're making your stronger ones even stronger. Um, and it, it's a powerful tool to be used throughout the entire system. You have mitochondria in every cell in your body. How many cells are in the body? <laughs> I don't, I don't know, remember, sure. billions of cells, right? So, you know, in high concentrations, all the mitochondria, there's going to be even more in the heart tissue. Um, so for cardiovascular strength, it's going to be very important. Um, it's going to be important for neurological function as well. Um, Just came up with an idea. We should buy a microscope. And while a patient is receiving NAD halfway through, we should pull out blood, put it into a microscope, and look at that, uh, look at their, so we got to do it before as well, so look at their blood before, and then look at their blood after with NAD. And then you can see if the cells, because you can look at the red blood cells and the white blood cells through a microscope and see how they flow, and see if they're actually increased health. That might be a cool one. Um, 
But yeah, talk about, I think we talked about mitochondria, we talked about neurological health. Let's move into the anti-aging realm of NAD and we'll end it there. I think there's a lot of information for people. Um, but does it actually increase telomere length? Does it actually decrease biological age? So, you know, there's still research being done about increasing telomere length. Telomeres um, are basically going to be the end codes on your DNA, which with every replication cycle, they get a little bit shorter. So as we age, they shorten, 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 shorten. And so potentially over time, more mistakes can be made from one replication cycle to the next, the shorter the telomeres are. So there's a lot of interest right now in finding out different ways to either decrease the rate of degradation or reverse it to make it grow again. Regenerative. Um, and NAD is one of the things that's being investigated uh, to that end. Um, but when you think about it, there's a lot of different things that are going to affect um, how we think about aging. And a lot of it is coming from oxidative stress and energy output from all of our ATP. If you can decrease the oxidative stress and optimize energy output, you're going to feel younger. You're going to be able to think like you had when you were younger. You're going to be able to perform athletically the way you did when you were younger. Um, because you can see it in the general population. You can take you know, 100 people that are 50 years old, some of them, their bodies and their minds are going to function like they're 80 years old. Some of them, they're going to function like they're 25. Yeah. Right? And that's, you know, a lot of that has to do with the oxidative stress, the energy output uh, from all of their cells, uh, and overall health. And NAD is one thing that can help to optimize and bring all of that up. Yeah, for sure. I think it's, uh, it's health, it's lifestyle, it's, you know, what you do. I was to bring it back to a car, it's just like, you don't take care of your car, it's not gonna run efficiently. So that's where it brings it back into the NAD, that's where it brings it back into oxidative stress, but how you should intake glutathione or get IVs regularly, so your body can perform at a high level um, over time, because we're putting more and more stress on the body. But as we breathe air, we're gonna create oxidative stress in the body. As you exercise, you're gonna create lactic acid in the body and your body has to break that down. But you're making your body stronger. Um, but how strong do you, can you make your body before you hit that plateau where your body's gonna actually decrease over time? So I think that's the balance. Like you can't overeat, you can't overexercise, you can't undereat, and you can't underexercise. So there's that like sweet spot um, of health that I think most people uh, want to get to and want to learn, but that will be the next topic. I think there's ways around it where we can get subjective symptoms and um, like, hey, I'm feeling tired, I'm feeling fatigued, I'm feeling not myself, getting the right supplementation, getting the right lifestyle, and getting the right nutrients, as well as objective data what your genetics look like. So if you run your 23andMe, those chromosomes have the telomeres at the end. And how do you optimize an objective data of how's my cardiovascular disease working? How's my hormones working? How's my liver function doing? How's my spleen? How's my pancreas? How's all that? But from an objective perspective of how do you actually change that through lifestyle? And how do I change that through my nutrition? How do I change that through the nutrient status of supplements or medications if needed? And I think that's where health will go. And, you know, doctors will just be the, the researchers of it all and, and implementation into an algorithm. Um, I think our body is an algorithm, but just way too complex for a computer to process right now. We definitely need more information for sure, but it's growing every day. And the more information we have, the more we can do. So genetic information, lab information. So the more data we have, the more we can tailor things to individual patients and uh, really try to optimize their health as much as possible. So wrapping up NAD, neurological health, receptors, withdrawal, opioid withdrawal, and it helps your mitochondria, and it makes more energy, and it can be anti-aging, um, and it just, you know, repairs cellular health, take NAD.